You know, this is the cleanest and nicest police car I've ever been in in my life. This thing's nice in my apartment. God, it's hot in here. Oh, God. The dog went on the picnic basket. Don't mess with the volcano, my man. Because I will go Pompeii on you. But... Trying hard not to show it. Yes. Frailty, right? Yeah. What? Gesundheit. What? No. Who? Who? Not frailty. Why? Who are you? Who? Hi, I'm Mark. <laughs> and I'm Tom. And we are the, the Cinemaniacs. Cinemaniacs. We have time to banter but, we do. Uh, in this respect because this is like one of the shortest shows that we've had for years. I know. Uh, There's we've not had for years. really any extracurricular activity per se no. to discuss. No. Nope. Uh, so we can just do, I think we're going to do about uh, 45 minutes per film. <laughs> I think so. So uh, sit so, back and relax. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but so, shall, yeah. we, shall we discuss at this point, since we do have time to talk, yes. the, the transition? Or do we want to do that at the end of the show? Uh, well, let's keep, keep them in suspense. Yeah. Tune in at the end of this program for a special Cinemaniacs announcement. Which thus implies tune out for the rest of the show. But no. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Tune in. Yes. Turn, turn out, whatever. Uh, so we have two theatrical films we to do. discuss. Uh, that everybody is waiting just excitedly for us to talk about. I'm sure. And, That's why uh, they're here. We had much uh, heated and, frankly, obscene discussion before the show started as to who would uh, start off the show. That's true. And uh, how about you? Uh, okay, fine. <laughs> uh, so um, what are you going to do when uh, there's been like a nuclear apocalypse or basically all of society has just kind of uh, gone to heck? I say that because it's before 10 o'clock. And um, you, you've, you've broken up all of society into, into little groups because you want to function properly. Uh, and it's your turn to find out, are you going to be one of the gardeners? Are you going to be one of the politicians? Are you going to be one of the cops? And you go and take the test and you find out, gee, maybe you're not a politician. Maybe you're not a farmer. Maybe you're a cop. Maybe you're divergent. Post-apocalyptic world where kids have to uh, run tests and, and basically uh, take care of the family and parents. I've seen this before someplace, but... Uh... I felt like I've seen this many times before. <laughs> yes, probably. This was, uh, okay, you know, I went in with a little bit of a beef because I saw the trailer on a DVD that we had been given to review a few weeks back. Okay. And I just laughed. I'm like, really? <laughs> Seriously? They're trying to pull this over on people? This right. looks so much like all of these... Uh, we really hope we're going to get a franchise out of this, at least three Absolutely. movies. It's legitimate because it's based on popular uh, young adult fiction. Maybe, what I wonder is, are all of these books as hacky as the movies are and all basically the same thing? Or is it once these books get to Hollywood, they have they to jam them into the down, molds right. that what a big movie has to be? Because, damn it, they all feel like they're, I'm watching the same thing over and over again. Right. You know, the, the person who doesn't think much of themselves but has a basing ability. It's the hero's journey. You know, right. Look it up. It's what every movie has been based on since <laughs> Star Wars. Uh, and I just find it tiring. Yeah. I, really, I couldn't really get into this because it felt so samey to me. I was really bored, frankly. Uh, it's about two hours and 20 minutes long. Ooh, yeah, and at one sure point is. I looked at my watch and, I, and it had only been on for an hour and I said, oh God, I have another hour and it, a half of this. It doesn't even get started really for an hour because we're learning, usually I'll complain and, and gripe that not enough backstory, not enough backstory. Holy cow, this whole thing, which is such a Hunger Games ripoff. And I know they're huge fans of this series back there. But you're right, it was, it was an hour before, because I found myself for the entire first hour saying, where's the conflict? Where's the conflict? We're just learning this and she's great at everything. The, most of the film is training. Right. The first chunk of the film is explains this world that we're in, and everybody has everybody is born into a certain status in life, and they have names, and they all dress a different way, and they do different <laughs> they have different functions in, in this in this world. And then you get to a certain age where you go through these tests that tell you which function you should be serving. Right. And then there's a big ceremony where you can pick either that or to stay where you are or to do something differently, which again all feels a lot like a lot of stuff I've seen before. <laughs> A little bit of Logan's Run. Logan's Run, way. absolutely. I was going to um, bring that up. And then 
we, our main character, uh, whose name is not Katniss, but Beatrice, which is you know awful close, <laughs> or Triss to be you know yes. f- for those who, who are texting and don't have as many characters to work with. <laughs> uh, so then it's training. So the bulk of this movie is this girl in training. And then the conflict comes really, that, that's the third act. The, co- the conflict is right. right at the end. And boy, there were times where I almost wanted to laugh out loud. <laughs> the, 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 I can't remember the name of the faction that she goes with, but it's all of the athletic, muscular, right. they're the peacekeepers and, and, and the police type uh, faction. And you see all these people lining up to go in to, to have these tests, and all of a sudden it's like, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> oh, fun yes. trains coming to town. And this train comes, and the doors are open, and everybody just jumps off the train hooting and hollering. And right. I, I just expected banjo music to start playing or something. It was almost laughable. That happens a couple times. I'm like, can they not afford brakes on these trains? It's always you're always just jumping off the train when you're, you're jumping on the train. Uh, so this I liken to the Hunger Games for obvious reasons, but also the Hunger Games have really uh, caught fire, if you will, no. with a lot of youths. <laughs> and I think it's... It, these work best for people who either haven't seen a lot of movies or read a lot of fiction, right. don't remember what they've seen and read, or people who are too young to have seen these kind of tales told again and again. Because it's the, the oppressive government and you know trying to mash down the individual and trying to break free, and you're not necessarily destined to be what the mold you're made with says you're going to be. And, and for, for me, it wasn't so radical or interesting enough to overcome the feeling of sameness I had for this, right. and frankly, the feeling of boredom, and <laughs> the whole, you know, the second you meet the beautiful male model, J. Crew, <laughs> or Old Navy model that's her trainer, it's like, oh, right. she's, she loves him, but it's a, a love that dare not speak its name, and I'm all mm-hmm. that, and it's just, this is really for teenage girls, I think. Now, having said that, uh, <laughs> I sat toward the front of the theater, which is, as is my want, and when I got up to leave, the second words appeared on the screen at the end of the movie. Uh, it was a pretty full crowd, and this was noon on a Sunday. Okay. So and I guess this movie's been doing really well. So I think, I don't know, I, I got home and Cricket said, how did the audience react to it? And it's like, well, it's, with a comedy, if you hear a lot of other people laughing, you know the audience was with it. But with a movie like this, I don't know. I mean, maybe if you saw this on a Friday night with a rowdy crowd and there was a lot of cheering, you'd know they were into it. I didn't hear anybody complaining as I speedily left the theater. So <laughs> I don't know. I, I think the target audience will probably like this. But if you're curious about it, I think there are earlier examples of this sort of thing that are probably better. Right. I think if you're a huge fan of the book and eventual series, obviously, I think you're going to enjoy it. It's very methodical. It's very predictable. You talk about uh, Triss's love interest, who is her trainer. Um, there's a little surprise, supposedly, toward the end that is telegraphed so far in advance that it's so obvious to see. This is very much, and and I think you, you can't avoid comparisons to the Hunger Games. And while I wasn't crazy about the first Hunger Games, I'm liking it more and more as it gets darker and a good bit more serious. So this one not only being too long, but that um, a, a couple of things about it. It's, it's really superficial. It's a very paint-by-numbers, watercolor kind of version of maybe the Hunger Games. Uh, it's certainly well too long. The um, I had issues with the middle... Uh, like hour, basically. I mean, it, it's basically only, it's two and a half hours, as we've said. So like the middle 45 minutes where they're training, you have these predictable characters who are the opposing characters, and half the time uh, she's being ridiculed for being, you know, a stiff and, and nobody likes her and she can't, she's no good at anything. And then the other half of the time they're all saying, oh, you're so great. It keeps bopping back and forth. The film doesn't seem to know how it takes its own subject matter. And while I found... The performance is decent enough. It's very much aimed at a, at a younger audience, which you know, which is fine. You don't have to. Um, but again, I think you're right that we've seen it so often. I think anybody over 20 will have seen so many iterations of this that while there's nothing terribly offensive about it, with the exception of its length, I think, and you could certainly, get, and that's not offensive. But I found myself, uh, uh, yeah, getting bored, bored by it. I wasn't looking at my watch, waiting for it to end, but I was just thinking, this film is long. So Divergent was, I, I went in knowing uh, basically nothing about it, except that it was very famous and, as, a, as a book, and I hadn't seen the trailer that you mentioned, so I went in completely blank, but you know, knowing a little bit about it, Dan Mitchell, who is a, a local radio host, uh, he and his girls are very, very into this and, hmm. and reading it a lot, so he was filling in a little bit of information for me. The trains, apparently, the L... Uh, it's apparently just like on automatic pilot. There are no conductors or anything, and so it just constantly runs and runs and runs. That and that's why they. That would have been an interesting idea to right. have in the movie. And and I found myself 
uh, alternately saying, interesting that you don't tell me some of this stuff about how or why this happened, but then also saying, why the hell is this happening and why don't they? And, and clearly you're wondering why they don't stop, why they have to jump off. And so that's weird. But if you notice at the very end of the film, uh, it actually does slow down and stop. Yeah. So I'm wondering, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. So it's really kind of this big jumble uh, that I might, yeah. al- I might agree that uh, you're taking this huge book and you're trying to shove it into a two, two and a half hour uh, film and you can't really address all the issues. So I think it might have suffered from that translation. I wonder if this is one where people who are fans of the book will see this and, and like it more because they're mentally filling in all the gaps right. with information we don't have. Right. The, the mortar, we don't have to join these bricks together, so to speak. The converse to that also right. being, obviously, that, oh, wait a minute, they didn't explain this, or they didn't, they didn't say this from the book. So I will be interested to find out, and, and again, movies at CheshireTV.org. Um, if you're a fan of the yeah. book, let us know what you thought. Uh, I, I think that's an interesting question. Will the fans uh, like it and, and kind of uh, allow those slight omissions that those of us who aren't familiar with it don't quite understand, uh, or are they going to uh, complain that, Oh, this is missing, this is missing, this is missing. It's a travesty. I don't know. Uh, either way, uh, it, it was the number one film this weekend. Yep. And there are already two sequels. Oh, yeah. Uh, because, as I always like to say, personally, I don't take any film seriously unless I know that it's part of three, a three-film <laughs> That's story. That's right, you can't. Uh, so the next one is called Emergent, and the third one may or may not be called Insurgent. I'm not sure. Okay. They're all urgents. Right. So I was saying before we started, they need to get a, a, some kind of a cross-promotion with Tide going so that there's <laughs> di, you know, divergent di- detergent or something. Right. Like and perhaps the third them. one is called Detergent where everybody comes clean. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, let us know what you think. We actually, I'm, I'd be very curious. I don't know anybody who's read these, right. these books. Uh, so on the other hand of that coin, on the other hand of that <laughs> thing, uh, we have a film... Your fair, famous, your favorite fabulous furry friends who are right over my shoulder Sorry. Uh, return <laughs> once more for more hijinks, international hijinks in Muppets Most Wanted. I'd been, uh, I was never a big fan of the Muppets when growing up. Sorry, um, I just thought they were kind of Miss Piggy. Always a fan. Well. She's just and, and and I know she's supposed to be kind of uh, boisterous and, uh, but you know, never super uh, super uh, crazy about them. And so when the movie started coming out, the Muppets Take Manhattan. I think the Muppets Take Manhattan was one of the first movies I ever walked out of. Really? To dangle a preposition. Wow. Um, that'll, that'll get you thrown out of a theater. Too. Probably, probably so. But boy, the last couple ones have really been pretty funny. Uh, they have new producers and producers who seem to have grown up and loved the Muppets. So there's a new rejuvenated sense, I think, of energy to these things. And so I've really enjoyed the last couple. So I was really kind of looking forward to this one. And uh, I can't remember the last time I laughed out loud as much as I did in The Muppets Most Wanted. I thought it was somewhat disjointed. One of the fun things about the Muppet movies lately is that you get a lot of cameos from famous people. And this is so stupid, and I acknowledge how stupid this comment is. But... In the past, the cameos and the characters were really kind of integrated into the plot, Mm -hmm. and they did important things, and they were just kind of appeared here. So if that's my biggest complaint about a Muppet movie, was that, oh, the stars that appear, with the exception of like Tina Fey and and, uh, Ricky Gervais. Who are arguably the two human stars of the movie. Right, absolutely, and they're both hilarious. Um, And Ty Burrell, the three human stars of the movie. Right, right. If that's my biggest complaint, uh, I certainly don't have much to complain about, because in the long run, it felt a little bit long. Maybe I'm, my attention span for all of this is getting uh, a little too short. This one felt a little bit long, like it could have trimmed it. But uh, overall, I thought The Muppets Most Wanted had everything that I expected it to have uh, and was, was really, really funny. I grew up loving The Muppets. I, okay. Yesterday, I was drinking out of a great Muppet caper glass. <laughs> the per, well, you need to know that most of the glasses in my household are, are old Burger King Tartan. glasses. So, okay, right, so, yeah, you know, exactly. hey, so that, there's that. But I have a set of great Muppet caper glasses. Uh, which I will come back to later because there's a point to that. Uh, so I, I grew up loving them, and, and as they went on, somewhere around Muppet Treasure Island, I started thinking, mm, these aren't that great anymore. Okay. And then there was they did a revival series called Muppets Tonight on ABC that was, eh, they brought in new characters that weren't as good, and you get used to somebody else doing the voice of Kermit after Jim Henson right. died. And then in the new movies, there are several different voices because Frank Oz is not uh, involved by choice. So y- you have to get over that. But... I really, really liked The Muppets, the previous film, so okay. I had high hopes for this, and I really like this, too. I agree, a, a lot of laughing out loud. Uh, I don't think there have been many comedies in the last few years that I've really liked very much. They all tend to be really lame or whatever. 
But this one, uh, it was Cricket and myself, my sister, and her two little girls who are mm -hmm. roughly six and ten. Okay. And everybody loved it. The, seeing the kids doubled over with laughter was great. Uh, it was funny with all the celebrity cameos you mentioned. Occasionally, I heard kids in the audience saying, who's that? Yeah. Like Sean Puff Daddy Combs comes up to some <laughs> kid and like, who's that? And then later, there's some blonde-haired kid who says like one line to Kermit, and the same little kid is like, oh my god, it's... So I'm like, and I'm here going, who's that? Right, I'm going, who's that? I'm like, exactly. that, that's... In, by the time it hits video, maybe, this is going to be the, the cameo that everybody just... that nobody's going to realize. So I must say, from a sky-high view, I'm hoping the next movie isn't about them going to New York for a lot, a lot of the time, running time. Because the previous movie, in very broad strokes, was kind of similar to the Muppet movie. You're right. putting the team together. This movie is kind of similar to the great Muppet caper in yep. that jewel thieves and in the, there's an opening song which was very cute and clever that is vaguely reminiscent of the opening song from Great Muppet Caper. And there's a little water ballet thing, which is something that was done in the Great Muppet Caper. But I let all that slide because it was really funny and clever and okay. jokes that I would not expect to see. And not like that they were crude or dark or anything, but that were just really clever, commenting on the fact that you're watching a movie or commenting on Muppet history and things like that. So I think this film has repeat value. I mean, I could oh, see yeah. this in the theater in the next couple of weeks and still enjoy it just as much. Uh, when you say uh, this is a family film, not in that it's completely squeaky and wholesome, but because the adults in our group, which outnumbered the kids, loved the movie, <laughs> and the kids loved the movie, okay. and they don't have much of a, a grounding in Muppets. They, I think, have just seen the previous movie because I bought it for them on DVD, <laughs> and I don't think they know the show at all. Okay. And something that's interesting about the previous <clears throat> film, this film too, is that it acknowledges the TV show, which yes. the old Muppet movies never did. The, the, the Muppet movie was about how they got together before they did the show, and then all the other films were just adventures. In these most recent two films, you get a recreation of the show on stage. Mm -hmm. So you get, I'm not going to say what they do with it, but the whole sketch they used to do on the show where everybody was dancing and they'd be throwing out lines. Or you get the opening of the show where the sign comes down and right. Gonzo plays a horn. So you get to see that in a modern setting, giant with surround sound. And there's something <laughs> that kind of raises, gives me goosebumps about that. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's almost like you're there in the Muppet Theater <laughs> watching it. Uh, which apparently at Disney World, there's a Muppets 3D film experience that you can see. Okay. The Cricket told me about where you're, you're actually in physically the Muppet Theater and stuff's going on around you and stuff. And, okay. and so anyway, that's I'm getting off, off topic here. But I really enjoyed Muppet Most Wanted. The cameos of people I never thought I would see in a Muppet-related <laughs> film. Some pretty serious actors, yeah. foreign and domestic. <laughs> uh, I, one thing that was interesting, I think this was originally titled The Muppets Again. Because the opening song, they keep saying yes. that and saying that and saying that, and I'm like, they're kind of pushing this as the title. And then even at the at the end, they bring that up. Right. And uh, that's not a big thing. That's just something I noticed. Okay. But uh, this was really good. I almost wish it was in 3D, just because. But uh, that might have been an interesting one. Yeah. Because again, I, I don't usually like the 3D, but this would be the kind of venue where you could go way over the top yeah. and really uh, blow out the 3D effect. You mentioned a couple things that. Uh, golly, I'd forgotten about, but really enjoyed was that it's a musical. Oh, it's there absolutely were many, musical. many musical numbers, and it's so much fun to see these people. Uh, I can't imagine that I would ever see Danny Trejo doing a bit from a chorus line. And Ray Liotta. But, but and Liotta was great fun. Uh, Ricky Gervais does a wonderful number. There are all there are a whole bunch of numbers in this that are very catchy and very fun. And I mean, so overall, I mean, I can't really uh, give Muppets uh, Muppets Most Wanted a bad mark because I really uh, it's one of the most enjoyable films I think that I'll say that I've seen in a long time. Funniest film of the year. Probably so. Probably. Uh, so we thank our friends at uh, Keen Cinemas yes. for providing these films with us in razor-sharp imagery and great sound, mm -hmm. uh, which was, again, for the Muppets, was a heck of a lot of fun because <laughs> I'm hearing the Muppet Show opening theme and I'm hearing stuff around me and behind me, and I never had that. There anymore. you go. Uh, and then we move on to thanking our friends at Video Headquarters for the titles we're about to discuss. Yes. Starting mm -hmm. with... Well, speaking of uh, funniest film of the year, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is just kind of down on his luck, and he needs some money. So if you need some money, aren't you going to, like, uh, uh, become a salesman and create a big, huge business and, and pull the uh, wool over many people's eyes? But if you're out to find some, a bunch of wool and you want to be the creator of uh, lots and lots of piles of money, you need to become the Wolf of Wall Street. I would say so. Uh... It worked for me, actually. Well, you mean the, the entire movie or the that scene? In Pretty particular? much that scene. That scene worked for me as well. Uh, I'll, I'll hear no, the whole movie. Uh, this is a comedy, okay? And uh, th yes. that trailer sells it as a comedy, but I think a lot of people... 
There are a lot of people who don't get subtlety or satire, or you have to be <laughs> doing saying, this. Are you equating, using the word subtle to describe the Wolf of Wall Street? <laughs> Funny Holy enough, cow. I am. Uh, <laughs> you you got to be like, fur, fur, waka waka, as it were, okay. and then people get it, it's a comedy. I, I didn't know it was a comedy when I went to see this in the theater, okay. and it didn't take long before I realized, oh, this is going to be kind of funny. Uh, it plays it more or less straight, but it is this extremely gratuitous telling of these yes. people who were just awful people. And <laughs> there's a lot of controversy in that this is, or there was, people thinking this glorifies this behavior. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. It shows these people to be these awful people that they were. And the whole time I'm watching it, I'm like, yeah, you, you have a great time because I, I know how this is going to end and you're not going to be smiling in the end. Although technically, I guess a lot of them were smiling. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it's like the most, this is a movie you watch and you're like, so what does it take to get an NC-17? Because <laughs> I, can't even, I can't even describe the first time you see Leonardo the DiCaprio's scene, character. You, I can't even say what he's doing. Yeah. And, and, and I, I was like, well, I've never seen that on a legitimate <laughs> theater screen before. Right, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's very long. It tells the tale of this Jordan Belfort, who's a real person, who uh, he was not in any way on Wall Street. There, right. Plays a little loose with the facts on occasion, but he basically sold junk bonds or, and junk stocks to rich people and made tons and tons and tons of money in the 80s. And he had this group of, of guys with him, guys and gals, and they just they were just criminals <laughs> and, and for a long time. And they, they rode as high in many senses of the word as they could <laughs> yes. until you know they had to pay the piper. And, and sadly, the reality of the end of the story, which they don't really get into in the movie too much, is that they never really had to pay much. The, the people who were victimized by these people were never paid back, and the lives that were ruined stayed ruined while these people you know, did a little bit of time and then went off to be able to essentially do the same thing or make money off telling people <laughs> what about did, what they yeah. did. Uh, so uh, let's, let's check it off. Uh, extreme drug use, check. Violence, check. A lot of sex and nudity, check. Uh, and great 80s soundtrack, check. So okay. what more do you want, really, frankly? Uh, I wouldn't let a kid be in the house while I was watching <laughs> this movie just for fear of what they would hear through the walls. Right. Because I, I didn't watch it again for video, and Cricket was several rooms away watching it, and I was in the living room watching Puppet Master 4, actually, and I kept hearing things being screamed from two rooms away, and I'm like, ha, that's a good thing the walls are <laughs> thick here. Right. Uh, so I really enjoyed The Wolf of Wall Street. It's an interesting counterpoint, really, to American Hustle, yes, because in a sense, to me, American Hustle was somebody trying to do the Scorsese thing and not getting how to. This was Wolf of Wall Street is Scorsese doing the Scorsese thing, maybe to an extreme. And also, it's essentially the same story. It's somebody from a lower class trying to, by hook or by crook, and illegally eventually trying to raise their station in life, being successful at it for a while, and then getting caught and having to pay the consequences. Right. So I, I, I've been blathering about this. I really enjoyed this. We have time to blather. Yeah. But no, I agree very much that, and, and I think uh, many people have compared, as we did when they were out in the, the theaters, uh, The Wolf of Wall Street to American Hustle, and you're exactly right that it is a very similar story, but very, very different approaches. Uh, uh, Hustle, which I believe we talked about last week, yes. uh, is kind of the, the slower, I think more character-driven, mm. um, and certainly... And we discussed this last week a little bit as well. A much less slick-looking film. It Certainly, feels like a '70s movie. Yeah, and I think, but movie. I think intentionally so. I think they, you know, they could have glitzed it up and made it look really super, you know, super slick looking. Uh, but I think they avoided that. A Wolf of Wall Street is exactly the opposite. Uh, you bring a, a brilliant director and one of the greatest actors that alive today with DiCaprio. And I was looking forward to this. I've never been a big fan of. Uh, Scorsese stuff. I respect the man immensely and his films. But while I'll agree that ultimately, if you're really sitting there with your critic's hat on, that this film doesn't glorify it. But I think for the average person and the average American audience, with the exception of those present, uh, don't really think a whole lot about movies. And so I think ultimately the message that is delivered by this film is a glorification of wanton sex and violence and, and drug use and all of those things that we had discussed. Uh, I think the film, with a serious analysis, doesn't say that. But ultimately, and this is what I took uh, from the first screening when we saw it in the theaters, you've, I think you've got um, a director of unbelievable power and authority and skill with Scorsese and uh, a, a series of actors. I think Jonah Hill is even, you know, he's starting to de demand some respect. He lost quite a bit of it from the, uh, not that he really cares about uh, respect from me. 
but uh, uh, I thought he was terrific in Moneyball, and so I was looking forward to him in this. I wasn't crazy about him in this. He DiCaprio, was a little cartoony. In this. Yeah, DiCaprio is is tremendous, and I'll watch him in anything. But I think, in my opinion, you have a film that is out of control. And I think it's out of control because nobody, who in the film industry is gonna go up to Scorsese and say, do you really wanna put a film out that, that says this? DiCaprio saying, I think you're we really see a lot of those. over the top, I don't yeah. know about this. So I thought this was a film that was out of control, um, that it's so wanton and over the top that uh, it doesn't read as a comedy in the long run. And so while, um, I mean, I can't say I even enjoyed watching this. It's certainly really? too long. What, like two and a half hours long? Something like this that. This and Divergent, yeah. you can forget about your entire day. But uh, in the long run, I was really kind of down on The Wolf of Wall Street. Super glitz, all of the things, if you want to see unbelievable wanton sex and violence and language and everything. Um, but DiCaprio kind of out of control. Everybody's sort of out of control. And I was not crazy, sorry, about The Wolf of Wall Street. One thing that occurred to me about this, uh, just, frankly, so I can have the last word. Uh, <laughs> There's a film called Detroit Rock City that I love yep. that most people don't know about, but it's great. And I was watching the commentary on that, and the director was saying, this story is the way the characters in this are, this basically is these kids retelling their story. So it's really extreme and ridiculous and cartoony because it's like, oh, dude, and then we did this, and then we did that. Thinking, and which kind of blew my mind because I never thought of a story being anything other than what is presented to you. Okay. That's the truth. Thinking about this movie yesterday, this almost could be construed as the same thing. This is Jordan Belfort telling his story through a hazy memory of these insane, drug-filled, debauched times. So it's almost like it's even more amped up than the reality was in the retelling because he's telling it to you, trying to impress you with how much of a slick, uh, you know, foxy guy he was. But at some point then the filmmakers, because if it's a, an objective camera and if it's presented like this is what happened, then we have no reason to question the, uh, in many respects, it gets back to Poe's um, uh, unreliable narrator. If you have a narrator who's telling us something and you have no reason to question that, then I think you have to take it at face value. Um, for me, it would have worked then more if there was some way to point to DiCaprio's character and say, yeah, he thinks he's doing really great work, but look at what's really happening. Uh, just a relative right. to the Detroit Rock, right. Rock City. Um, May be I, the only people, by the way, to compare these probably. two Probably. <laughs> Um, but I always, you know, mention to our filmmakers that uh, you talk about that being the director commentary in the Detroit Rock City. Well, the director can't go to every single theater and peek out right. and say, oh, by the way, everybody, you know, here's the film and what it's worth. Um, do I recommend this? Uh, if you're a fan of motion pictures and, and DiCaprio and great acting, and, and of course, but just go into it realizing that I think it... Um, uh, I think it's kind of out of control. That's, but that's my b biggest comment mm -hmm. that I can say about it. This is a film that is out of control, and I think it could have been a better film if somebody had a little bit more control with it, especially in hacking maybe 20 minutes or so. I often find that with, with big-name directors. It, I hate to use the Lucas thing, but it, him yep. and other people, you always, it's like nobody has the guts to step in and say, you know, if you changed it, it might be a little bit better. Maybe you uh, get rid of Jar Jar, maybe. You know, I hate to bring that up. But, yes. Uh, so speaking of if you changed it, it might be a little bit better. Yep. Uh, Vince Vaughn is back, and he is a, 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 a screw-up who can't do anything right. But the one thing he could do right was give a lot of donations to his sperm bank. <laughs> so years later, he finds out that he is unwittingly the father of a hundred, several dozen, mm -hmm. a whole lot of kids who all want to oh, know nice. his identity. And he is also known as the delivery man. Yeah. Boy, you better uh, be a Vince Vaughn fan if you're going to watch this one. Uh, you know, you know, you know, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I always hate to go way back with everything, but loved Swingers. Okay. And, and made that Vince Vaughn and John Favreau did. So I've always been a fan of Vince Vaughn, but he's one of those guys who I think makes bad movies like 95% of the time. Okay. I still like him, so I, every time I, I have to see one of his movies, I'm like, well, at least Vince Vaughn is in, is in it and he's fun. But man, it's not very good. You're right. Uh, this is much less of a comedy than the trailers make it look like. Yes. This has got a lot more heart than you would expect, which is, is fine if you're looking for that. Maybe, I think audiences maybe aren't ready for Vince Vaughn in a drama, so they have to sell it as a comedy. But had they sold it as a drama, that I think fewer people would have been disappointed in what they got with this. It's amusing on occasion, but I didn't find it very funny. You don't get a lot of Vince Vaughn doing his fast talking, trying to talk his way out of it thing like you right. want. Um, it's a remake of a film from another country that I believe was called Starbuck. Exact same right. thing, but in a different language. 
uh, which I haven't seen. So I don't know if I would recommend this. May, might be a good date movie. Uh, I wouldn't really call it a family film because it gets into some kind of gruesome bodily function stuff here and there and, and t talking about how things were done. Uh, my, the greatest thing I took away from this movie is that it had a T-Rex song playing under the end credits. <laughs> right. And I'm a big T-Rex fan, and they're not known in this that. country. So if I can sit in a theater and get that music in surround sound, right. a song I've never heard in public before, that made me happy. Nobody's going to rent it because it's a T-Rex song in the last three minutes of it. But right. that's about as much as I can say about this. Someone I would really say... Someone's going to download Bangagong or something. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is light of love. Uh, if you want uh, a great, funny Vince Vaughn movie, I would say... Maybe the internship if I you want love, something I recent. I love the internship. Which I didn't think was great, but it was funnier than this. Yes. Or, or go, go way back to Swingers and, and really see where it all began. But Delivery Man, <clears throat> eh. See, I uh, started out not liking Vince Vaughn because of his persona, the character that he always plays. Just as, I mean, this is what he is. He's kind of brash. And, and grating, yeah, and, and, Right, he's kind of grating and he's irresponsible. And that's kind of become his character for some reason, somewhere along the line. I started developing a liking for him, which is one of the reasons I like the internship quite so much. And I think one of the reasons that uh, I'm more accepting of this than either I should be or than that you are. Uh, you're certainly right that this is not a comedy. It's very much more a, a, a sort of a, uh, it's a dramedy. Yeah, uh, there's there's comedic moments in there, but not nearly enough. You can feel times where this is supposed to be funny, but it doesn't quite work. So it's, I think the team behind it probably just didn't have their chops yet. Um, I don't know, you know how everybody, I don't remember who directed it or anything like that, but you'd think Vaughn would be enough of an influence that he could have stopped and, and identified where it wasn't working. But I think you're right that in many respects, he's the, uh, the Michael Caine of the comedy world where if there's a script popped in front of him, he's going to take it and he's going to do it. So this is not certainly on tops of my list of his films. Uh, I think there are numerous other ones that work well and I need to go back and, and rewatch uh, the earlier ones of his that I didn't like now that I kind of like the guy. You can skip Starsky and Hutch. I just, I'll just tell you that. Well, yeah, that. okay, fair yeah. enough. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, Delivery Man, I think... You got 90 minutes. It's not bad, but it's certainly nothing I'm going to jump uh, right out and recommend everybody go get because it's so rip roaringly funny. Don't think so. Speaking of rip roaringly funny, well, uh, hilarious. But if you want to save, uh, you want to save the day or save uh, uh, an evening or something like that, um, you could be a young dinosaur who has to. Um, speaking of chops, I don't know dinosaur chops. I don't know where I'm going with that. But uh, 3D animated, uh, if you have the opportunity. We, we keep going back and forth. I'll go here and then I'll address there. But in any event, I'm going to talk to you right now. I'm going to tell you that maybe you want to go out and be walking with dinosaurs. How about that? Ooh, bad day for that uh, pterodactyl, pterodactyl, I guess. So one of yes. the things, um, I was really down on this uh, in the theaters, primarily for one reason. And that trailer, if you haven't seen it, uh, is in many respects the reason that I was just knocked for a loop as I was watching it because you've got, uh, I mean, if you take a look at, it says here, starring Charlie Rowe, Carl Urban, uh, John Leguizamo, Justin Long. It well, does star Carl Urban. Yes, but, but starring, that. right, that's true, but these other people, it's like, uh, how can you have them? And I wasn't aware that we had speaking dinosaurs. Oh, it's and, a dinosaur movie. Right, so what a surprise uh, for me with that one. Um, I was expecting this, and you mentioned this off air, I was expecting this to be kind of a, like um, March of the Penguins, yeah. where it's, a, it's an animated version of what life would have been like for this poor little dinosaur as he's growing up. And when we start getting uh, dialogue and things like that, it was like, what movie am I watching? So I watched a little bit of this. Um, I didn't watch the whole thing, I admit that. Um, on video when we got them, and this again comes out tomorrow if you're watching tonight. Um, and and if I you're think watching after tonight, after it will the, always be it will there always tomorrow. be there tomorrow. Okay. Probably so. There you go. Um, so it was it was less. I don't know, troubling? I don't know. I just, I was Traumatic. so unexpecting it that don't expect it to be a dialogue free, you know, like Morgan Freeman doing a voiceover, oh, the dinosaurs are doing that. Um, I mentioned just funny when uh, in the theaters, I forget what movie it was that we, we saw, but uh, there's another. Um, Oh, it was about it was about the bears. I think there's another one coming out about bears, and Morgan Freeman does oh, the voice. Oh, it's the, the the lemurs of Madagascar. Yeah, it's the lemurs which looks of, exactly. Great, by the way, does look great. But I just yeah. laughed when I heard Morgan Freeman because I don't think I think there's a law in Hollywood yeah. that nobody can do voiceovers except Morgan Freeman. Anyway, we're not talking about Morgan Freeman. We're talking about Walking with Dinosaurs, which, uh, in retrospect and slight reviewing, I think I liked a little bit more. I think it's uh, really aimed at younger kids. 
yeah, uh, quite clearly. Scary. And so my fault, given the expectation going into the theaters. But I think, um, you know, certainly nothing offensive by it. I thought the animation was pretty good. Maybe not... Um, given the stuff that we'd seen, heck, 20 years ago from Jurassic Park with unbelievable photorealistic stuff. Uh, I thought you could have done more with the animation, but it was acceptable. It, uh, I had the same experience that you did. I think I saw a trailer that was a little bit of a later trailer than that one that you used where uh, it tipped its hand a little that they were going to talk. Okay. And that was really a big mistake. Uh, it opens up... But tipping the hand or having them talk? Having them talk. Yes, and, I agree. And maybe not tipping your hand, its hand <laughs> uh, early was a bad idea. Uh, it's for little kids, and for little kids that'll be fine, because they, they probably will... They get into it. They can identify with the characters and all that. But it feels weird to say it had anachronistic dialogue, because <laughs> uh, dinosaurs didn't talk. Uh, but there are times where they use modern phrases, yeah. like, you know, party time or something like that. And I'm like, oh, it's bad enough that they talk, but don't make them dumb. <laughs> uh, so it starts off with live action people, contemporary. And that's where you have Carl Urban. Right. That's where you get your, your Carl Urban fix. Uh, and funny enough, Judge Dredd is, you probably can't <laughs> see it in the white shot, he's, he's, in it, he's, but... he's over there. Uh, it's Carl Urban, or maybe not. Who can tell? He's got the mask on. Uh, so it starts off live action, and they find a dinosaur tooth or something, and then it flashes back and tells the whole story of you know how it got to be there. And visually, very impressive. The landscapes are gorgeous yeah. in this movie. Uh, it kept making me wonder, did they shoot real live action and then, backgrounds, right. or is it CG, or what? Uh, the dinosaur animation is not bad for the most part. It, it again, and maybe it's just because when we first saw Jurassic Park, it was like, oh my God, dinosaurs right. are real. Maybe if I looked <laughs> at it again now, I wouldn't feel like they were so realistic as I did then. Uh, but at times, this did feel like, boy, we've come a long way. Couldn't it be better, as right. you said? Uh, what I thought was cool is that there is some scientific education in this film. Okay. When you first see a new species of dinosaur, it freeze frames. And, it, and as my friend Isaac pointed out last night, just like the Roadrunner cartoons, it freeze frames and it tells you like the species yep. and a little bit about like on the screen. Right. And that was kind of cool. I didn't expect that. Right. I'm like, oh, that's cool because there are a lot of kids who get into paleontology because they watched, you know, Beast from 20,000 Fathoms sure. or something when they were a kid. So this is a movie for little kids. Adults may enjoy the visuals of it, but boy, the dialogue was really a mistake. And yeah. I, I thought the same thing that this really... For me, this should have been like March of the Penguins. It should have been, this is the life of the dinosaur, this is how they migrated, this is how they interacted, and somebody was just giving you facts. Because then I would have felt like I was learning something rather than just, you know, I'm a spunky little dinosaur, <laughs> I don't want to get eaten, right. and that kind of stuff. So it is what it is. I would recommend 10, uh, 10 million years BC, 20 million years BC with Raquel Welch. <laughs> you got Raquel in there. Mostly for be, uh, two things. Right. Uh, so... Yeah, so that's everything we have. Yep, I think so. But uh, we also have a, a mutual friend who uh, we do. is doing pretty well, and we might be able to talk up some stuff. Yeah, we have a moment. Uh, for the guys in the booth, there's a folder in here with some stills that we can bring up. Uh, so our friend Ian Judge, who yes. was a former Keene State uh, student in the film program, he was mm -hmm. a year or two below me, and he went on to become the manager of the Somerville Theater in Somerville, Massachusetts. Right. Or Boston, if you're from up here, and it's all one just big <laughs> it's city. It's all one big place. Uh, which is a beautiful old theater that's been, uh, it's its 100th anniversary this year. And uh, you step in the front door, and it's it's been modernized in some ways, but the big main theater is still the big main theater, and boy, does it feel like you're stepping back in time. Okay. Gigantic balcony, little box seats over the edges of the stage, uh, beautiful old artwork. There's a lobby outside the second floor balcony. That's how big the place is. Uh, they do live events there, like U2 did a surprise concert there a few years ago and made the news. Actually, if you search for, if you do a Google image search for Somerville Theater, you get a picture of U2 playing there. Uh, so anyway, I brought all that up because last, weekend before last, a friend and I went down. They're due, to celebrate their 100th anniversary, they're running double features of movies that played there over the years, okay. from 1914 to now. <clears throat> and they ran two Elvis movies, who I'm a fan of, and they're arguably the two best ones. Okay. Uh, Viva Las Vegas and Elvis, that's the way it is. And they're doing all 35 millimeter prints for these. They've all been pristine prints so far. Wow. And it's two movies for 10 bucks. Not bad. And you can go in at any point. It's like the old days. I kind of, and Ian comes out before the movies, and he'll introduce the film and tell you some facts about it. And he'll do something I wish they did at every theater before every movie. He says, please silence your phones and turn off the screens. Anything that makes sound or light 
we don't want it. <laughs> and they even have a little uh, sign at the box office right at eye level saying, use of cell phones during performances will result in immediate ejection. Excellent. And for some reason, my eyes and brain <laughs> read that as immediate electrocution. And I was like, that works for me that too. That works for me, yeah. Uh, so anyway, if you, so there you go. One of the things they're doing, which is really cool, is they're doing a, sc a 35 screening of Wizard of Oz, but they're wrapping a live stage show around it. Okay. Like they used to do back in the old days. So before the movies, for your chump change, what, 10 bucks, um, you get a live orchestra playing some music, you get live vaudeville acts, like jugglers and ventriloquists okay. and all that kind of stuff. So uh, old cartoons and short subjects, and then you get the movie. And I grew up with my father telling me about you know, what you would get for you know, 15 cents right, when he yeah. was a kid at the movie, which was like <laughs> half a day's worth of entertainment. And uh, I don't know if you have a shot of, uh, that's the, the program, they've printed up a pretty little program, that's the outside of the theater. And uh, these showings are going on, I think, until the end of May. I think we have another still that just shows a few of the... So you can see what they've got. They've got It Happened One Night and His Girl Friday, Godfather 2 and 3, Grease and Saturday Night Fever, Taxi Driver and Clute. I mean, when's the last time right. everybody showed Clute? Uh, <laughs> Doctor Strange, Love and Easy Rider. Just really cool stuff. And I'm not trying really to shill for them so much as I am saying how great it is that any theater is doing this these days. Right. So many theaters... With the advent of digital, it's easier for them to just throw a DVD or a Blu-ray in. And unfortunately, a lot of studios are kind of pushing that. They don't really, they're getting right. kind of lazy about wanting to send prints out, which is a shame because DVD and Blu-ray, while they look great at home, they're not meant to be blown up on a 40-foot right. screen. Uh, so if anybody is in the Massachusetts, New England area and wants to look it up, Somerville Theater, uh, it's really worth making a trip down there someday. Yeah, great um, opportunity. And Ian was kind of telling me some things he's planning to do in the future, <clears throat> which guaranteed that I will be going back in the future. <laughs> Just the kind of thing that, again, who would show this in this day and age? And the answer is... Well, I think in many respects, I mean, as you talk about how uh, digital has really kind of taken over, and in many respects that can be <clears throat> uh, unfortunate, at least for film purists and those who love that. Um, right. And I think it forces places like Somerville and our local colonial to come up with these unique venues. And yeah. I think hopefully we'll be seeing more and more of those. And I mean, th there's a good thing about digital, too, in that the picture and sound are great. Uh, and it, there are th DCP is what they call the new thing that is delivered to theaters, and it right. used to be two big cans, and now it looks like a little lunchbox. <laughs> it's yep. a hard drive, basically, with digital files. Uh, but studios are producing a lot of repertory content for DCP, and not just the top ten movies of all time that everybody tends to show. So theaters that are interested can't really show stuff like that that looks great. Right. Uh, the Somerville likes to be true to, the, to its roots and to its history, so they go for film when they can. And uh, a little bird told me. They might be doing a 70 millimeter film festival in the near future well, too, there you go. which very very few places in the country are even equipped to do anymore. That's true. Uh, the Putnam Theater at Keene State can do that, yep, and has over the years. And it's 70 millimeters, a larger film frame, so it's a higher resolution of film and just a better quality image. As long as the film isn't you know filled with scratches and hasn't turned red <laughs> over the years. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because I thought it was really cool, and it's still going to go for a few more weeks. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's through April at the very least. It is, and it's just—it was a heck of a lot of fun. It was—it was. It re I had stopped going to the movies in Boston for a long time because the audiences there were really. Everybody thought they were in mystery science theater, you know. Oh, so I was, wonderful. For me, before I went to this, I'm like, this is either going to close the door permanently on this <laughs> experience or reopen it, and I'm very happy to say it reopened it Great. for me. So. Anyway, yes. So, uh, well, any, any old business or new business? Uh, well, any new business we might say is. Uh, oh yeah. My that. understanding is that uh, we will not be here next week. No. Strangely enough, uh, we've been feeling a little boxed in, kind of a little uh, trapped About in this, this respect. And uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, Cheshire TV will be uh, adventing into a new widescreen format. Yes. And so we're going to take a little. Uh, corporate time to um, change that around and for us to redo all of our graphics and things like that. You probably have more background information on the techies and the whys. Well, we're stepping firmly into the 2000s at Cheshire TV <laughs> with uh, HD cameras. So all of the shows that are being created starting the week of April 7th will be Here's the funny part. They will be created yes. in HD, but you're not going to see it that way. Uh, we're still broadcasting in SD, so everything will be widescreen, uh, which for people with 4x3 TVs, it is what it is. For people with widescreen TVs, if you hit the zoom button, it'll fill your screen. Uh, it might look a little cruddy, but it'll fill your screen. And uh, for me, I'm excited because we're going to have a bit more space on to see more. So of I don't have to be quite as close set. to you as I have exactly because right? it's good. uncomfortably close. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, it'll look a little <laughs> different, and and you're going to be busy uh, banging your head against your computer screen, creating <laughs> right. all new graphics for the show. <laughs> yep. Uh, from now on. So that's why we won't be here next week. Sorry about that. And I, we were on like a roll, too. We had like three we new were, shows in a and row. and we were able to chat and everything like that. So two weeks from now, you'll see us in uh, spectacular widescreen. And we'll be talking about this fast because we can get a lot of everything in. 
Well, you have to, yeah. Excellent. We'll pitch it up. So, I guess until then, I'm Mark. And I'm Tom. And we are the, the Cinemaniacs. Cinemaniacs.